gather together this Lord's Day, let's immediately turn our attention to His Word by way of a call to worship. I'm going to be reading from the Old Testament from Psalm 130. Let's hear God's Word together. A song of ascents. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him there is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. And folk, with those words in mind, let's bow together in prayer and ask for the help of the Lord by His Spirit to come and help us experience the realities of what is contained in those magnificent truths. Let's bow together in prayer. Our God and Father, we thank You for the great privilege that we have through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ to approach Your throne of grace with confidence. Lord, we consider even the question embedded in that psalm. Lord, if You were to mark iniquities, who would stand? And the answer would have to be a resounding no one. No one could. But with you, there is plentiful redemption. You forgive. You redeem. You rescue. And Father, we're thankful for the fact that this side of the cross, we can look back to the great truth that the Lord Jesus Christ did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but uh, made himself nothing, taking on the very form of a servant and becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Lord, we're thankful for the fact that through him and through him alone, as love indeed stepped down to earth, that uh, we could find a, rec a redeemed and reconciled relationship with the Most High God. Lord, we're thankful for Christ. We're thankful for the fact that he is the uh, good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. And so, Father, we do pray that as we proceed in worship this morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning, that we would be eagerly reflecting on and anticipating uh, the great truths that we will be reminded of even as we come to worship this morning. So be with us, Lord, even as we meet digitally in a rather unique format. Lord, we do pray that as we read, as we sing, as we pray, and as we hear your word, that you by your spirit would minister your, to your word to us. We ask this in and through the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Because well, I joy to welcome you this morning, and wherever you are, in your lounge, your kitchen, uh, your sitting room, your study, a gathering together, or maybe huddling together with your family, watching the service, won't you sing along with us? You can see the lyrics on the screen behind us. Come a fount of every blessing, a magnificent hymn that tracks the grace of God, past, present, and future. As we look forward into eternity, when freed from sinning, we get to see the lovely face of the Lord Jesus Christ as we worship before Him forever. And uh, let's uh, join our hearts and voices in that great proclamation this morning. Come a fount of every blessing.
to that we can only really just say what the Apostle John writes in Revelation, Maranatha, indeed come, Lord Jesus. And we echo that refrain even in the midst of the fallen brokenness that we come to worship in this morning. So wherever you are gathered together, welcome to you. If I can just reiterate that again. The very fact that we're meeting in our cyber congregation this morning on the 19th of April means that our president extended the lockdown beyond the 16th of April, and uh, we trust God's providence in terms of that. Our God is still on His throne. He's still ruling and reigning, and even as as these events unfold, even even for a prolonged season of a lockdown and a slightly different way of doing life and doing ministry and being the church, we trust our sovereign God who is seated on His throne to accomplish His plans and purposes through all of these weird events that we're experiencing. These are the effects of the fall, but through that we realize that even though all creation is groaning in its corruption, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. We have a long view. We have that uh, wonderful hope that Christ is coming back and that one day on the clouds with great power and with great glory, He will arrive with the angels attending and with trumpet sound and will bring this messed up world to an end. And we get to enjoy eternity with Him in a new heaven and a new earth. That's our hope as believers, and we certainly come to celebrate that this morning. So again, folk, we're gathering together in uh, weird spaces, uh, trying to do church this morning. And we do pray that even our time together as we uh, hook on to either Facebook or uh, YouTube, and that you're tuned in, Lord, we, uh, we do pray that this would be a blessing and an encouragement to you. We are deeply thankful. Uh, for the technology we have. We are deeply thankful for the tech teams and the music teams that have sought to make this uh, production available in a way that is meaningful and engaging so that we can still be the church uh, gathering even remotely. And let's pray together uh, that uh, the Lord would certainly use our time together this morning, wherever we are gathered, that we would still be one in heart and mind and spirit to lift up in uh, the name of Jesus Christ. But just a reminder to our members and regular attendees just to continue to be faithful in terms of prayer for the church. Uh, We certainly need that. We need wisdom as a leadership team as we navigate our way through this rather uncharted territory. Uh, They don't teach this stuff in Bible college. The elders' textbooks do not contain a chapter on how to handle lockdown as a local church. And maybe in the later editions that need to be written, these things need to be covered. Uh, But we've certainly been blundering our way through, trusting in the Lord and His wisdom to lead us and guide us. And we do pray that uh, that would have been accomplished. So pray for us. Pray for for our leadership team, elders and deacons together. Uh, Can I exhort you to be faithful as well in terms of care and connection with each other? Uh, Do pray that even what we've experienced over the last couple of weeks would have been a very meaningful engagement of the church with each other using phone calls and SMSs and WhatsApps and online uh, portals and so forth. Let's continue to do that. And even more so when we are able to enjoy physical contact again. When social distancing is lifted, let's connect uh, even more meaningfully in, in those ways. But again, folks, just a reminder to be faithful, thirdly, in terms of giving, uh, just so that we can sustain church life and ministry and uh, make sure that the lights are kept on and the water keeps flowing and uh, a ministry still happens, even in terms of all the other essentials that we need to. We're still supporting mission work uh, further afield, uh, so continue to be faithful in terms of giving in those particular areas. I'll focus my privilege to just lead you in a short time of worship this morning. And our attention really is on the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in the Old Testament, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. With those wonderful pictures of being led beside the quiet waters and into the green pastures of having our soul restored by an encounter with the good shepherd who is God. But the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. He is the one who stepped down out of heaven into the sin-affected world to bring us the fullest experience of the love and the mercy and the grace of, of God. And it's our privilege to be able to worship Him this morning. So we're going to merge together a couple of songs that really just acknowledge Christ stepping down, uh, bringing joy, bringing peace, bringing hope, bringing help to us as lost sinners as a demonstration of the love of God and then reaffirming that we will trust in Him and in Him alone. So wherever you are, the, the lyrics will be projected behind us. Uh, won't you uh, sing along uh, to, on your, by yourselves or with your families, and let, let's acknowledge the worth of Jesus Christ, even as we worship together this morning, when love came down to earth.
some magnificent truths contained in the song that we've just sung. If you consider just that last line of verse 2, the punishment of God on God has brought me peace. God the Father pouring out His justice, pouring out His wrath, pouring up the pent-up fury for every sin of every believer, every committed, pouring that out on the Lord Jesus Christ who became the propitiation for our sin the wrath absorber, sucking all of that up in his own body as he suffered and died there on the cross so that we eternally don't have to endure those realities. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Christ, the good shepherd, laid down his life for the sheep. And we get to enjoy the benefits of him eternally as the good shepherd, not just for all eternity to come, but even in our own lives right now. As the Lord being our shepherd leads us and guides us and restores our soul and leads us in ways of righteousness with a great future looking hope that uh, we get to be with him forever. For surely I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, read Psalm 23. Let's affirm that together in song with that great refrain, I will trust, I will trust in you alone.
So even though we walk the darkest path through this weird season, even though we walk the darkest path that we've experienced as a church and as a community and as a city and as a country and as a world through the COVID-19 pandemic, we will not fear. We will not fear the evil one. We will not fear the affliction and the pestilence that the evil one brings. For We know that God is with us and his rod and his staff are the comforts that we need to know. And therefore, on that assurance, we can say with confidence, I will trust I will trust in Him alone. May this minister to your soul and prop you up and spur you on. Well, folk, after that wonderful time of worship, let's come now to God's Word. So won't you turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Don't panic. I'm not re-preaching where we've been over the last couple of services. But I want you to go right to the end of that chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to be looking at the last couple of verses. This is almost a little Easter mop-up sermon. Uh, We spent some time in the first couple of verses of 1 Corinthians 15 on the 5th and the 10th and the 12th of April, just tracking through the theme of first importance, having a look at the gospel message and how that's rooted in the historical facts of the resurrection. But uh, I just want to, in a sense, tie the threads together this morning and uh, go right to the end by way of just uh, cementing those messages, but also, I think, providing just some encouragement to us as individuals and as a local church at this time. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and that's where we're going to be right at the end of that chapter. But let's bow together in prayer. This is our opportunity as well as we typically do to come before the Lord and in humble dependence and just to come before his throne of grace and plead with him for his grace and mercy for ourselves and our world at this time. So let's bow together and pray. And directly after that, we'll dive into God's word. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we think back to the verses that were read to us even at the start of our worship this morning by way of the call to worship. As the psalmist really just comes before you and pleads, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. And God, at this time, that's exactly what we want to do. We want to come and we want to plead to you. We want to plead for your intervention. We want to plead for your strength. We want to come before you, recognizing that you are the sovereign, eternal, supreme, holy, righteous, just God of this universe. Lord, we think even of how that psalm unfolds. Lord, if you were to mark iniquities, who would stand? And the answer would have to be no one. Lord, our sins, in a sense, stand before us. But praise God that with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. And so, Father God, we come before you this morning just mindful of the needs around us within our own local church, within our community, within our, within our city, within our country, and certainly across our world. And in the words of the psalmist, we want to say, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. And Father God, we do pray that that would indeed be our our soul's attitude as we consider the issues around us that are beyond us, as we consider the brokenness and the wickedness and the pain that our world is gripped by, where else can we turn to but to you? And to you alone we come, to to your word alone we look for hope and guidance and direction. And Father, we do pray that even in the attitude of worship this morning, as again we're gathered together in abnormal circumstances in our lounges and kitchens and studies and TV rooms, maybe by ourselves, maybe with family members around. Lord, we do pray that it would be the soul with the soul attitude of wanting to wait for the Lord, to depend upon you, to hope in you, to trust in you, and to find our confidence in you and in you alone. Where else can we turn to? Lord, we are thankful for the assurance that we can bring ourselves and our issues before your throne of grace to find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. And so, Father, we come as needy people to do exactly that this morning, mindful of the fact that in you alone is our fount of blessing. Thank you, Lord, for the grace that you have shown towards us uh, historically. Thank you for the present grace in which we stand. Thank you for the great future-looking grace that you have promised as well for us as a reality is to come, not just through our lives, but for all eternity. And uh, we cling on to those. Lord, we are thankful that as we've just sung, when love came down to earth and made his home with men, thank you for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, for his life, his death, his resurrection. Thank you for the opportunities of being able to marvel at those great truths of the last couple of services together. 
And Lord, we do pray that uh, we would indeed have our souls fed as we think back to the Easter message. Lord, we think of those lyrics, Psalm 23, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. And in I will trust, I will trust in you alone. And Father, we do pray, strengthen our faith and our confidence in God. In the midst of the issues that we're facing, in the midst of the grip of the coronavirus, COVID-19 across our globe and increasingly across our country, as we face the issues of lockdown and the frustration that comes along with that, as we consider the impact in terms of industry, as we consider the impact financially that's affecting even our own people as a local church, as we consider the ever-present risk of disease and infection and uh, isolation and quarantine and treatment and possibly even death and bereavement. Lord, we are thankful for the fact that in the words of the psalmist, the mighty fortress is our God. And uh, Lord, we do pray that uh, we would indeed find you as our strength and refuge at this time. Father, we do pray for the church of Jesus Christ across the globe at this time to indeed be salt and light in our communities. Lord, we do pray that even as messages are resounding through the airwaves and through cyberspace this Lord's day, that uh, the message of Christ and the gospel would be upheld, that, in, that that would burst like light into the midst of the darkness and the despair and the hopelessness that is gripping so many. Father, we do pray for our own church folk who are struggling with issues and struggling with the future and looking at decreasing bank balances and uh, diminishing work opportunities and uh, really just un uncertain as to the way ahead. Father, we do pray that you, by your, the power of your spirit and through the encouragement of your word, would come and minister and bring peace that passes all understanding. Bring the hope and joy that is found in Christ alone. Be gracious even in terms of practical interventions. Lord, we're thankful even for the intervention this past week. A number of food parcels uh, delivered from Parker's Community Church to our church plant in Dipslut. And uh, for the blessing that that was brought to many of the folk there. And uh, Father, we want to just thank you for the partnership that we have in the gospel. But Lord, we do pray that that would be used in a very real sense to alleviate the pain and the suffering and the frustration that is there. So Father, we thank you for the fact that uh, even in these dark times, even in the midst of the issues that we're facing, as we see all creation groaning under the corruption that it is gripped by, Lord, we're thankful for the fact that this is not the end, that Christ is coming back, that he will come and make all things new, that as believers we have the hope of uh, eternity where there is no more pain, no more sickness, no more disease, no more death, where COVID-19 is not an issue, where we can be together for eternity enjoying the fellowship and the unity and the intimacy and the worship of Christ that we were always destined to have. So Father, we do pray that as we continue in worship this morning, particularly through the preaching of your word, that you would teach us, that you would instruct us through the power of your spirit, cause Christ to be exalted, cause our faith to be strengthened, and of course, your name to be magnified. We ask these things in and through the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me ask you a question as we get going this morning. Why do we do what we do? Or, or, or put differently, if you don't know why a particular task is necessary, what motivates you, what fuels you to actually go and engage yourself in that particular activity, in that particular task? I remember many years ago at junior rugby level, it just came out of primary school and it was first rugby practice and we we're gonna go and play. And the anticipation as we went to play was, we're gonna get the ball, we're gonna run, we're gonna pass, we're gonna tackle, we're gonna have some fun in the field. And yet practice after practice after practice did not involve a ball, did not involve kicking, did not involve tackling, it involved running. Lots and lots and lots of running, cross country running, running up and down the stairs, up and down the corridors, uh, swimming across the swimming pool and up and down the embankment and across the pool again, sprints on the field. Faster, faster would go the coach. And we were like, Dude, what's your problem? We we're here to play ball and uh, kick a ball around, not do all this running stuff. We couldn't see the purpose of why that was necessary. But only afterwards, as we got later into the season and maybe we grew up a bit and uh, playing at the older age levels, we realized that the fitness training, the pre-season fitness training and the conditioning and the strength training was so necessary to be able to actually play the game and enjoy the game in a way that was safe. That all those hours of drudgery just didn't make sense to us at the time. We didn't see the end goal. We didn't actually understand what the reason was for doing that. And therefore, it was a great frustration. Maybe you think back to learning a musical instrument. 
piano for example, and all you wanted to do is sit down at that keyboard and hammer out your favorite tunes and grab some sheet music and be able to play. And yet the teacher would force you to do those C major scales and those D major scales and up and down and up and down, and treble and bass, right hand and left hand together. Just that discipline of grinding through the drudgery of those boring scales. And again, you're asking the question, why? Why do I have to do this? What's the end goal? What, what motivates me? What's the benefit of, of the activity that I'm doing? Because in the moment, as we're going through that discipline, as we're fulfilling the command, as we're doing what we've been told to do, often we don't get the reason. It doesn't make sense to us in the moment. If we're just given a command or an instruction or a task to do, and we fail to see the value, we fail to see the, the benefits of that, it becomes really, really hard to do, doesn't it? And if we can't grasp the purpose, if we don't see the value, if we don't get an idea of the end game, it robs us of joy and motivation and fulfillment in the very action of what we're doing. That task, that activity, that uh, um, instruction that was given becomes a burden. Something that just has to be done. And there's nothing that spurs us on or motivates us or compels us if we don't see the reason right from the start. Well, folk with that in mind, can I suggest to you that the same is true when it comes to matters of faith and the Christian life? If, for example, I were to say to you or I were to read to you, I want your Christian life to be like this. I want you to be steadfast in your faith. I want you to be immovable. Let nothing shake you or rock your world. I want you to be abounding in the work of the Lord. I want you to be diligent. I want you to be faithful. I want you to be productive. I want you to be working really hard in terms of Christian life and ministry. And as you do all of that, I want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your work is not in vain. What would you think? What would you feel? What would you say to me? And I would imagine you would be grappling with issues that you really, really battle with in terms of, but I don't feel that way. Gavin, I don't feel particularly steadfast. I don't feel like I'm immovable. It feels like my work and my labor and everything that I'm doing is just a waste of time. I feel frustrated. I feel discouraged. I, I wonder what I'm doing, where I'm going. Does, is there any value in terms of everything I'm doing for the Lord in terms of church ministry? Where does my motivation come from? Why should I? Why should I be immovable? Why should I work? What would even cause me to, to want to live and to, to serve in ways like this? And those are the issues that I think this particular passage answers for us this morning. We've just come through the Easter weekend. And as I said, I want to try and tie the threads together. Folk, I would venture to say to you that often we sadly and wrongly reduce the Bible just to a manual or a manual for Christian living. It's like the owner's manual. If you just read it, it'll teach us how to live, how to speak better, how to make better decisions, how to make wise choices, how to live well. If we just follow some rules and some guidelines, you'll be fine by doing those particular things. And we miss the point that God in his inspired word in the Bible gives us instructions to do things and say things and uh, live in a particular way. But those commands, those imperatives, those injunctions, those directives are never just arbitrary and random. God has not just given us 66 books of how-to instructions with little tips and uh, little life lessons to follow. Here's the to-do list in terms of Christian life and living. The Bible is not just a random arbitrary collection of commands to follow that we need to try and rummage up some strength and wisdom to try and implement in terms of our lives and living. Folk, I want to suggest to you this morning that the Bible contains ideas. The Bible is full of concepts. The Bible contains doctrine. The Bible contains theological truth. The Bible starts to inform our minds. 
We need to have our minds filled. We need to grasp the concepts. We need to grapple with the ideas. We need to rationally have our brain cogs turning to try and get our minds around the ideas that God has laid down. And as our minds are then filled and transformed, it filters down into our lives and our living and our speech and our attitudes and our choices and our relationships and what we do. But the starting point is never just a to-do list in terms of action. The starting point is get your minds right, get your thinking right, get the truth cemented in your brain cells. And as that happens, our choices and our decisions and our outlooks are naturally changed. The Bible never ever starts with just action. Do this and don't do that. God always starts with our brain cells. He gives us thoughts. He gives us ideas. He gives us truths. He gives us concepts. He gives us doctrines to change our thinking. And as our thinking changes, so our lives change as well. If I put that slightly differently, our behavior doesn't just come from nowhere. Our behavior, our actions are shaped by what we think. Our thinking brings forth good and evil in terms of our lives and our action. That's true in every area of our lives, but we want to focus particularly in terms of Christian life and ministry this morning because the same is true. The way we think surfaces and reflects in what we do. Our doctrine, our theology, our view on biblical realities, our worldview, how we regard the world around us, shapes what we do every single day. And folk, with that in mind, can I suggest you that that is why good churches and good leadership teams and good elderships and good pastors place such a high premium on teaching and instruction. By caring for the truth, by preaching truth, by teaching truth, by upholding truth, by making sure that even our music and our lyrics are shaped by biblical truth, we're equipping our people to be able to think differently. And as they think differently, they then go and live differently. But if our starting point is just a to-do list in terms of practical Christian living without ever challenging the mind, we're working from a very flawed foundation. Folk, we would be failing you. I pastorally would be failing you if I just gave you some 10 tips on how to live for the next week every single Sunday. Some quick and easy things. Here's, here's a toolbox for the week of, of some nuts and vault bolts that you need to go and put into practice. Here's a package of DIY, do-it-yourself Tips on terms of how to be a better Christian or how to have stronger faith or how to be more stable or how to make better decisions. If I'm giving you that without a foundation of mental truth and doctrine and theology, the how-tos are always going to fall flat. That's not going to be soul food for you. You're always going to be battling in terms of the implementation of that. But what we need to see is that ideas have consequences. And the Bible works in exactly the same way. The Bible makes it crystal clear that the ideas that we have, that the thoughts that we have, that God has given us, flow into life and living. And I just want to lay a bit of a foundation for that this morning. I know this is a, a lengthy intro. I will get to 1 Corinthians 15. But I want to just lay this down very, very solidly so that you can see the logic that the Apostle Paul is following even as he comes to this 15th chapter in the book of Corinthians. Our thinking shapes behavior. Our ideas have consequences. And the Bible works in exactly the same way. Let me give you an example. Example number one, we would see, for example, in uh, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, where the Apostle Paul says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we may have hope. We want hope. We want something to look forward to. We want to know where we're going. We want to feel good. We want to be satisfied. We want to be fulfilled. We want to be motivated. We want to know there's a purpose for life and living. Well, where does that come from? 
If I just said you go out and have more hope, that would fall flat because it's not grounded and rooted in anything. But what Paul does in that verse is he takes us back to the Old Testament that that which was formerly written for our instruction is the basis for our hope. As we're grappling with truth, as we're grappling with God's revelation, as our minds are being filled with His truth, the hope flows from the realities of what our minds have been filled with. Here's another example. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, where Paul says, The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. In other words, we need to be loving people. That's the issue. That's the outcome. And I could give you some tips. I want you to go love people, just care for them. And here's some 10, 10 quick tips in terms of loving behavior for church life and your neighbors and friends and family and so forth. Again, it would fall flat because there's no substance to that. But look at what Paul says. The aim of our charge, the aim of our teaching, the aim of our instruction is love. Where does it come from? From a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. In other words, the instruction that he gives shapes the ideas that they have. And as their thinking is changed, they then start to demonstrate loving behavior towards each other. Our lives, our behavior is shaped by our thinking. And folk, we can see that numerous times through the Bible. How many times, and it's recorded probably over about a thousand times in the Bible, is the word therefore or so then. In other words, as we've considered something, as there's been teaching given, as there's been doctrine laid down, as ideas have been presented, on the basis of that therefore or so then or since that, you need to go and do. But the starting point is never just go and do. The Bible always lays down the ideas and the concepts first before it gives us the instruction to go and put things into action. For example, Romans chapter 5 verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Where does our peace come from? Because we have been justified by faith. What about Romans chapter 8 verse 1? Therefore there is now no condemnation for who? Those who are in Christ Jesus. Those that are in a relationship with Him have no fear of condemnation. I could say to you, don't have any fear of condemnation. Grounded on what? It's baseless unless we actually see the underlying uh, teaching that has come before that. Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 6. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow. Oh, that's great. We're in the middle of Corona. We're in the middle of COVID-19. My finances are trashed. My pension's slipping. I don't have work. I don't have food on the table. My children's education is uh, suffering and so forth. Don't be anxious. But it's grounded in what precedes it in terms of the care of God for His people. And uh, He gives that extended treatment of God's care and concern for us as people. Therefore, do not be anxious. And there are many, many other examples that we could look at, and I'm not going to spend too much time on those. Folks, the reason I've spent so much time laying this foundation down this morning is that is, is, is exactly what we see when we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Apostle Paul has laid down a foundation through this whole chapter, and we started having a look at it last, uh, of the last couple of services, of the future, of resurrection, of life, of hope, of victory, of glorified bodies, of Christ coming back, of Christ being the victor, of Christ being the first fruits of the resurrection. And therefore, based on where he's gone, we know that there is a resurrection for us as well as we follow in a sense in his footsteps. His reality becomes our reality. Paul's laid down all of those rich truths all of the way through this 15th chapter. There is future hope. There is heaven. We're going to get new bodies. And the believer, in a sense, is stirred up mentally to be encouraged by those rich uh, theological doctrines. Folk, where Paul's gone in 1 Corinthians 15 is rich. It's deep. It's substantial. There are some heavyweight truths to grapple with. We need strong coffee and some vitamin B shots sometimes to even just 
be able to engage with the thinking of the Apostle Paul in terms of what is to come. Our, our minds sometimes are, are stretched and blown even by the, the, the weight of the argument that he is presenting. He delves into some intricate issues, the resurrection of the dead and what is to come. But all of that is supposed to be an encouragement and a faith builder for us. There's a danger that we look at this kind of chapter and this kind of thinking and go, I just want to skim over that. It's too heavy. It's too complex. I don't understand it all. Gavin, just give me some practical tips for Christian living. That's what I hooked up onto YouTube for this morning. I just want to feel good. I just want to know what to do as I click the off button and I go and live life with my wife and my family in my home during lockdown. Don't give me all of this resurrection stuff. It doesn't affect my life day to day. Resurrection and heaven and the afterlife is so far removed from where I'm at right now in terms of life and living and struggles and church life and trying to do ministry and care for people. It doesn't have any bearing on me right now. Tell me what to do. And I would say to you, wrong. Wrong. Because our ideas, our thinking, our theology flows into our life and our living. How we think shapes our actions. Let's see that together. I promised you we'd come to the text eventually. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I want to read you from verse 51 through to 57. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through to 57. Let's read together. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. For when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Folk, do you see it? The greatest reality, the greatest idea in summary that Paul is giving here is that Jesus Christ is the victor. That Christ is triumphant. He has triumphed over sin. He has triumphed over Satan. He has triumphed over the grave. He has triumphed over death. He has triumphed over hell. Jesus is alive. Jesus is coming back. Believers in him will be raised imperishable with him. We get to enjoy a resurrection, new bodies, new glorified bodies. The power of death has been defeated. That through faith in Christ, Christians have victory together with our Lord and Savior. Those are truths. Those are theological realities. Those are doctrines. That is what we believe. That is what our minds cognitively hold to. That we grasp intellectually. That we affirm in our hearts and that we throw ourselves upon by way of trust. But again, I'm sure you're asking the question, so what? That's nice. Nice truths. Nice systematic theology. Gavin, what does it mean? How does this feed my soul? How does this shape my life in real ways this morning? Folk, I didn't finish reading, did I? Go back to your Bibles. Go back to 1 Corinthians 15. I finished off at verse 57. But look at how Paul concludes. Read with me. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Do you see it? Do you see what God commands us to be? That's the final punch. That's the application. That's the how-to. That's the toolbox. That's the DIY kit. What Paul is directing at these Christians, this church at Corinth, is practical application based on 57 verses of thinking and doctrine and theology that have preceded. 
Don't miss the point that he's writing to believers in Christ. He refers to them as my beloved brothers. This is, is an instruction to those who know and love and submit to and obey and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And what does Paul say to them? And in fact, what does the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of God's revealed word that's endured, endured for us through the centuries, what is God saying to us today? He says this, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. On the basis of all of this rich future looking theology, the ideas that are there, Paul hits them with three ministry commands, three ministry commands that still speak to us today. And every single one of those ministry commands is fueled and is motivated and is undergirded and is strengthened by the victory and the future looking hope that believers have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Without verses 1 through to 57, verse 58 falls flat on the table in front of us. Empty commands, just go and do these things. But if we don't understand the reasoning, we're always going to be battling with the, the application of those. The, the ideas shape the application. Let's have a look at what the Apostle Paul says to them. Three motivations for ministry that uh, are undergirded by the great future looking hope that we have in Christ. Motivation number one, instruction that he, number one that he gives to them is be stable. Be stable. Just look at it there. He says, be steadfast. And fuck in a sense, that means to be unwavering. That means to be stable. In fact, the, the Greek word has a sense of even, even sitting down. I'm sitting down. I'm here on my rock. I'm here on my chair. I'm here on my whatever it is, my stool. And I'm holding on and you're going to struggle to get me to move. You're going to battle to get me to budge. I'm down here on a Sunday afternoon in my sofa and I am steadfast. I am immovable. I'm not moving from this place. No, come hello, high water. This is my posse. There's a great Afrikaans word that I think we could almost substitute here. And that is fasat. Just put your butt down and don't Move. That's the place where you want to be. Be steadfast. Be immovable. I have a 70 kilogram burbul. When he sits and doesn't want to budge, he is steadfast. He is unwavering in his commitment not to move away from that particular floor tile. I can call, I can coerce, I can bribe, I can drag, I can shout, I can whisper, I can whatever. But if the dog doesn't want to move, he doesn't move. That's why we call him. We have a little nickname for him, the rock of Gib uh, the dog at least of Gibraltar. He's immovable when he doesn't want to move. And that's the picture that the Apostle Paul is giving. Be steadfast. We'll discuss in what aspect of life in a moment. I think it gives rise to the second word that the Apostle Paul gives here in verse 58. Be steadfast and be what? What's the next word that you see? Be immovable. And both of them hang together. In other words, don't, don't be readily changing in terms of your thinking and your positions and your opinion. We don't want to be so pedantic that, we never, uh, that we're never teachable and are, are never able to learn from other people and so forth. But the point is here in terms of the essential issues of the Christian faith, know what you know. Don't drift. Don't chase the wind. Don't float here, there and everywhere in terms of every truth and every doctrine and every belief and every book and every radio show and every person that you're following and every WhatsApp and every email and every message that you give and every Facebook post. And you're just pulled here, there and everywhere in terms of thinking. No, says Paul, in terms of your thinking, be steadfast, be immovable. And folk, I would venture to say to you in this particular context, he's saying be immovable in the gospel. Think back with me just a few weeks to where Paul was in the opening verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. For I delivered to you as of first importance that which I also received, that Christ died according to the scriptures. 
that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Paul, I think, is tying the threads together here in verse 58. He's saying, remember the gospel. Remember that which is true. Remember that which is factual. Remember that which is historical. Remember that which is central and foundational to, to your belief. And as he comes to the end of this chapter, he takes us back there and he says, be steadfast and be immovable when it comes to those truths. Don't be wavering. Don't be shaken in the, in the actual reality that Jesus died, was buried and rose again. Don't waver and be shaken in the, in the, in the fact that he's coming back. Don't ever doubt the fact that death is defeated that the grave has been conquered, that Christ is victorious, that the victory has been won. Believers in Corinth and believers at the Randburg Baptist Church here on the 19th of April 2020, be steadfast and be immovable in those great gospel realities. And the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, and he makes this point, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. In those verses, he talks about the faith and the gospel. It's two different ways of speaking about the same thing, the body of truth, the doctrine, the theology, the facts, the, 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 the essence of our belief system that we hold to. And Paul says, be rooted, be grounded in that. Don't shift from that. Don't shift from that hope. That gospel alone is that which can rescue and which can save and which gives you hope. When he says here, don't be steadfast or be steadfast and immovable, I think he's contrasting that with what he wrote to the church at Ephesus there in Ephesians chapter 4. And we read, picking up at verse 11, that God in his goodness gave the church, the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And listen to what follows. That picture of maturity that we're supposed to have. So that we may no longer be children. Tossed to and fro by the waves and carried around by every wind of doctrine. By human cunning. By craftiness in deceitful schemes. What Paul's saying there is the same thing just from a different angle. Don't drift. Be secure in what you believe. Don't waver. Don't chase the wind. Stability in mind and belief and thought is what we're called to. The gospel is an unchanging gospel. The gospel is a secure gospel. We have a secure faith. We have a secure hope that is rooted and velcroed onto, welded onto, in fact, to a, to a secure message. Therefore, stand in that. Don't shift from that. Don't deviate from that. Don't move from that. Look, I think what the Lord is saying to us this morning as we hear this message is this. Have lives and have ministries that are not marked by following trends, that are not followed by the mass hysteria, that are not follow, followed by popularist appeal and the charisma of smooth-talking, white-suited frauds and charlatans, the very peddlers of the gospel, that are out to get what they want to out of the message, but there's just an a absolute farce in terms of ministry. Paul is saying, hold to that which is of first importance. Christ died. He was buried and he rose again. Cling on to and be steadfast and immovable in that which is true and enduring, that which truly saves, that which truly sanctifies, that which truly strengthens. And what message is that? The gospel that Christ died and was buried and rose again. Stick to those cardinal truths and do not deviate, do not waver in terms of your belief in them. So stand firm, be steadfast, be immovable is the first imperative that he gives to us. Flowing from that, secondly, we need to see that Paul says work harder. 
Just look at the second phrase there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Always abounding, says Paul, in the work of the Lord. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. The work of the Lord, quite simply, is Christian ministry. It's everything that we do as unto Christ and because of the relationship that we have with Christ. We're not saved by good works, but we're saved by God's grace unto good works. We, we have works that are prepared in advance for us to do. As we read in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, God has prepared stuff for us to do. As believers, we're to be involved in church life and ministry and kingdom work. Paul writes to Titus there on the island of Crete in Titus chapter 3 and verse 8, and he says, those who have believed in God must be careful to devote themselves to what? Good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. There's stuff to be doing in terms of serving Christ and serving his kingdom and serving his church. But folk, look at the language that Paul uses. Always abounding. It's almost overflowing. It's got a sense of almost excess. Look at what God wants you to be doing and don't pull back. Do even more. Paul's exhorting them to even greater heights in terms of Christian service, what they're doing for the Lord. Folk, we need to heed that this morning. Don't we all need to hear that message? Oh, there's work to be done. The Lord Jesus Christ and his church needs to be served. And I think what God is saying to us is higher and deeper and more fervent involvement is what is called for. The kingdom of God needs to be served. The fields, my friends, are white unto harvest. harvest. Just like in the time of Christ, so as today, there are multitudes around us who are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Do we not know, even in our own friendship networks, in our families, in our, our community, how many confused and hurting people there are? Even within our own church community are our sheep, God's sheep, Christ's sheep, under Him as the chief shepherd, who are vulnerable and who are hurting and who are confused and who are bruised and who are battered and who are alienated from people and have broken relationships and they can't connect with people. They are lonely people because of COVID-19 lockdown. There is hurt, there is bereavement, even in our own church family. Our sheep need to be defended, they need to be fed, they need to be nurtured, they need to be protected, they need to be led. Friends, there is work to be done. And this is not just for the pastor and the elders and the leadership team and the connection hub leaders, but all of us are called to abound always in the work of the Lord. I think this resonates with what Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10, where he says this, As each one has received a gift, so use it to serve one another as, God's stewards of, uh, as good stewards at least of God's very grace. And then he breaks it down. Whoever speaks, that's the, that's the public ministry. Whoever's speaking, teaching, preaching, leading worship and so forth, do it as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves, that's the Low key, not the low key stuff, the behind the scenes stuff that uh, others might not even see in terms of just church life and ministry. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies, so that in order in that everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Fuck, I think the issue is clear. Don't stop. Use your gifting, whether you've got speaking gifting or serving gifting. Work actively for the cause of Christ. And so Paul says, always be abounding in the work of the Lord. Serve even more. And particularly folk now, we're in lockdown. We can't do church life as we ordinarily do. But can I suggest you that through this period, and even when it might be eased and lifted in some way in the weeks and months to come, this is not the time to withdraw my friend, this is not the time to pull back. This is not the time to look for excuses. These passages give, give absolutely no leeway for backseat Christians. These passages do not make any provision for Sunday Christians. These passages do not allow for pew warmers. 
We're not allowed to take a break. There's no suspension from ministry until I feel comfortable and my issues are resolved. No resting is allowed. Always be abounding, says Paul, in the work of the Lord. But what we see here is a call, a clarion call, an in-your-face challenge from God to you for shoulder-to-shoulder, hands-to-the-plow ministry. We were in the trenches together, getting our hands dirty. Even in the messiness that comes as we serve together and rub each other sometimes up the wrong way and irritate each other and sin against each other, but be involved. We have to be serving Christ and His church, using our natural talents, using our spiritual gifting. Christ and the church and the kingdom demands that of us. It's always been true. Been true for two and a 2,000 and a bit years. But can I suggest to you this morning that nothing has changed. We're here on Sunday the 19th of April, facing another just on two weeks of lockdown until the end of April. And even then, we're not sure of how President Ramaphosa is going to roll that forward or lift it or alleviate it or have some phased approach. I would imagine there's still going to be impact on us as local church, that there might be restrictions on the gathering together of people. Nothing's changed. We, we still need to be always abounding in the work of the Lord, even now. And can I suggest you, even especially now, folk, our church has needs. Our Dipsler church plant has needs. Our community and our friends and our family network has needs. We're living in a fool's paradise if we don't see the pain and we don't see the fear and the frustration and the hopelessness and the despair. We can see it even in our own interactions, sometimes even in local church where there's wobbliness in terms of faith. Folk are feeling the loss of weekly connection in a real way. They're feeling the loss of the encouragement and the, the stirring up of the fire, even through corporate worship and instruction in the, in the fellowship groups and youth meetings and Sunday services. Even now, even now, always be abounding in the work of the Lord. And we can't get to people face to face, that's true, but we can still be ministers of God's very grace in and through Christ. And so the challenge comes, don't stop. Keep going, greater heights, greater depths in terms of involvement uh, for the cause of Christ and the kingdom. Always be abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Why? Thirdly, let's look at the third phrase. Paul says, be stable, be steadfast, be immovable. Always would be active, secondly, in terms of working harder. But thirdly, he says this, be assured, my friends, it's not a waste of time. Be assured that it's not a waste of time. Have a look again there at your Bibles. Verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, comma, what? Knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Knowing that your labor is not in vain, as it's done in the Lord, as it's done in Christ, as it's done unto Christ, as it's done because of Christ. Everything that's done because of Christ and for His namesake is never, ever in vain. It's not futile. It's not a waste of time. Absolutely everything that you do has value for the cause of Christ. Think about it. Our preaching, our teaching, our service, our cares, our caring, our prayers, our involvement, our, everything that we do in terms of ministry has value. Why? Because the gospel is real. Christ died, He rose again. And therefore, every time we show people the cross, every time we show them the power of the risen Savior, every time we interact with them in the name of Jesus Christ, pointing them towards the, their sufficiency in Him, all of those interactions, whether they're one-on-one -on -one coffee dates or an SMS or an email or a WhatsApp call, has eternal value. Nothing is in vain. We saw that last Sunday in verse 14. I just bounced on it very briefly on Resurrection Sunday from the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, in other words, the resurrection didn't happen, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain as well. But Paul's point is this. Christ has been raised. The resurrection is a reality. The victory has been won. 
and therefore we have future hope. And therefore everything that we're doing for him, for Christ, has value. Our ministry, our service, our involvement uh, serves the Lord in that way. I would venture to say that we need to hear that message this morning, don't we? I need to. Maybe our elders need to. Our Connection Hub leaders might need to as well, even through the season. Do you ever feel that there's no value in what you do for the Lord? I mean, be honest. There's no one else around. Maybe there is, but I don't look them in the eye. But just in your heart of hearts, be honest. Do you ever think that what you're doing is just a waste of time? There's, there's no value. You just don't see the, the outputs. I mean, you, you're preparing and teaching those classes, the Sunday school classes, the fellowship groups, the Bible hour classes, whatever it is that you're doing, me preparing sermons week by week. And go, you're going for, for weeks and for months and for years, some of you even for decades, and you're asking the question, where's the fruit? I don't see the, I don't see the results in people's lives. They're still doing the same things. Where's the, where's the output? I mean, you've discipled and you've poured yourself into somebody's life and there's just no seeming progress. You've drunk endless cups of coffee with them and poured over the word and taught them scripture and tried to counsel and try to give direction and... They're still as stiff-necked and hard-hearted as they ever were. There you are serving the Lord, pouring that tea in the hall afterwards and shaking those hands and stacking those chairs and playing your instrument and singing your songs and recording and typing those minutes and keeping those accurate records of ministry. And where's the value? I don't see any value that comes from that. Maybe you've gone to that person. Your child, your parent, your brother, your sister, a friend, a colleague. And you've shared the gospel in that stumbling, bumbling, half-baked way where you kind of even missed out some key ingredients and the person seems disinterested and there's no professional faith and you're praying for them in terms of breakthrough. Oh God, it's a waste of time. It's all futile. Am I wasting my time, you ask? Is there any value? Shouldn't I be doing something more spectacular for Christ and going to Bible college and going to be a missionary in the out of Hebrides or somewhere, my friend, can I just point you back to this verse? Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your work is not in vain. Your labor, your effort, your agonizing in that particular ministry area is not in vain. Hear that from God this morning, my friend. Nothing done for Christ, nothing done in the service of Christ, nothing done in terms of suffering for Christ, nothing that is done as a joyful, obedient act of service as unto the Lord Jesus Christ is ever a waste of time. No resources, no time, no, no money is ever wasted in the cause of what we've done when we're seeking to serve him and build on, a, on his foundation with gold and silver and with precious stones. God's eternal redemptive plan stretching into heaven and for all eternity to come is based sometimes on our weak, fallible, sin-affected efforts, but it's never wasted for the cause of Christ and the gospel. C.T. Studd was an English cricketer who pretty much gave up everything, his whole fortune, to go and serve the Lord as a missionary in Africa. And in one of his writings, Studd said these words, and I quote, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. What I do in terms of life and living is never wasted for the cause of Christ and the gospel. Even that which, which, which we think is feeble and inadequate is still used by the Lord to extend his kingdom and to glorify his name. During this whole COVID-19 pandemic, uh, a number of you have seen and shared via WhatsApp and Facebook the little video clip of that uh, Irishman, the Irish pastor from North Belfast, Pastor Lee McLennan, who was in isolation in that isolation ward fighting for his life and uh, really just struggling and lying there just alone with God and uh, praying, I think, through two terrible nights, thinking he was going to leave this life and uh, depart to, to heaven and uh, really just struggling with the health issues. And McLennan, in that video clip, it's about five or six minutes long, recounts how in his great time of need, just pleading with the Lord for some intervention, how the Lord sent a cleaner. And McLennan 
uh, attributes his survival even through COVID-19 to the prayer of that cleaner uh, that was uh, given there in that isolation ward in that uh, hospital when he was in acute uh, respiratory distress. And is pleading with the Lord for a sign of his grace and mercy as well as uh, he started to turn the corner and he felt a little bit better. He just His body was crying out for coke and I think it was some prawn flavored crackers or chips or whatever. And this cleaner came back and uh, provided exactly that without even knowing what was in this man's heart and mind. And it's just an incredible clip how we actually see the Lord's provision using the most lowly, unlikely means. A cleaner just doing his job, stopping by, spending some time in prayer, and then feeding the stirring of the Holy Spirit to go and buy this man some food. And he didn't even know that it was exactly what he was crying out for. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that that work is not in vain. Those simple acts of kindness and charity, just reaching out in, Christ, in simple Christian service, had such a dramatic impact, not just on Lee McClellan's life, but that's rippled through the globe. And we can just see the power of simple service being demonstrated in a way that glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing, nothing, nothing we do is ever in vain when done as unto the Lord. And folk, as we consider those three imperatives of be stable, be steadfast, be immovable, of keep working hard and knowing thirdly that it's not in vain, be assured of that. Again, as we tie the threads together, we need to see that that is not just a to-do list in terms of go and run into that brick wall and uh, do it as hard as you can. But it's rooted in these great gospel realities that precedes. Where does the motivation come from? Why should I live that way? Why should I serve that way? What would even want me to live and serve Christ in those ways? It's all there in the word, therefore. What Paul has spoken about in the rest of in the preceding part of this chapter provides the grounds and the stirring and the fuel for these commands. Therefore, on the basis of the resurrection, therefore, on the basis of Christ that being the first fruits, therefore, on the basis of his triumph and his resurrection, therefore, on the basis of your future looking hope, knowing where you're going, that you're in a victory procession with Jesus Christ, that there is reward for you on the basis of all of that. Be steadfast, be immovable, always be abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that everything that you do for him is not in vain. Don't you see it? The hope of the gospel, the hope of the resurrection makes all of the effort, all of the labor, all of the agonizing, all of the sacrifices that we do for the cause of Christ worth it. Every bit of struggle, every bit of effort, every bit of pain and frustration that we go through counts for something in the light of eternity. We might not see it now, but it does. No work done for the cause of Christ is ever futile and a waste of time. Won't you hear that this morning on the 19th of April when Satan comes and attacks you and he causes doubt? Our confidence lies in ideas and truth and doctrine, that which we know to be true. We hold on to the great truth that Christ died and was buried and is alive again and that nothing we do for him is in vain. My friend, when your own faith flickers, when the events of life threaten to overwhelm you, when there is no longer any quick fix, quasi-Christian pop psychology stuff to give you that little band-aid for the day, reflecting and understanding on the great truths of the gospel is the only food for the soul that you need. Christ died. He's risen. He's victorious. He's coming back. And that brings perspective to our lives and our living and our service for Him. Remember Baptist Church family, and if this message is going even broader, whoever it is that you are that is listening to this this morning, as a believer in Christ, if you've trusted in Him, if, you, if, if you, you've embraced His finished work on the cross, believed in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, then these truths are for you. You're part of the beloved brothers, the, the believers that are referred to here in this passage. Be gripped by this, be grabbed by that, be guided by these great truths. Let them feed your soul and then let them shape you and motivate you and energize you in greater ministry and service for Christ. May the Lord take these words and indeed cause us 
to be steadfast and to be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that everything that we do for him is not in vain. May the Lord add his blessing to these reflections on his word this morning. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we thank you again for the great truths of the gospel. We thank you for the reminder of the last couple of weeks that we've been able to reflect on that. And flowing from that, Lord, is a charge. Go and do. And Father, we do pray that we would heed what you say to us this morning. For those of us that are weak and wavering and wanting to shrink back, not even just from the faith, but maybe just from church life and ministry, thinking it's too hard or it's a waste of time or I've been bruised and battered too much and it's just too overwhelming. Father, I pray, stir us up. Stir us up again. Cause us to be immovable and steadfast in these great truths. Firm in our faith, not drifting here, there, and everywhere. Cause a greater fervor to be uh, manifest in terms of desiring to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But Lord, undergird that with the assurance as your Spirit brings it to us that nothing we do for the cause of Christ and the kingdom is ever in vain. Encourage our hearts with those great truths, we pray. In Jesus' precious name we ask. Amen.